Good afternoon or good morning, depending on what time zone you're joining us from. And thank you for joining us for our discussion on anesthesia residency programs. Today's webinar is sponsored by the HMS Office for Diversity, Inclusion and Community Partnership. The mission of the DICP is to advance diversity and inclusion in health, biomedical, behavioral and STEM fields in ways that build individual and institutional capacity to achieve excellence, foster innovation and in ensure equity in health locally, nationally, and globally. DICP efforts support the career development of junior faculty, trainees, and students, uh, identify and train leaders in academic medicine and health policy, and provide programs that address crucial pipeline issues. A little bit about the VCP webinar series. Today's program is the eighth webinar in the 2021 Visiting Clerkship Program webinar series. For the past 30 years, the VCP has been a model of excellence, offering uh, outstanding medical students, particularly those from groups underrepresented in medicine, an opportunity to participate in externships at HMS and its affiliate hospitals. Since its inception, over 1,500 students have rotated through the visiting clerkship program. The VCP has been drastically impacted by COVID-19, and we recognize there's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to the upcoming application cycle and what residency uh, will look like. With this uh, concern in mind, we're hosting a series of webinars that bring together uh, the HMS residency programs and medical students to share ideas, provide support, and address questions on transitioning to the next stage of medical training. The webinar uh, the webinars provide an opportunity to discuss the application process and address questions that students may have on a variety of topics. Uh, just a couple housekeeping notes. The chat is not available uh, and your microphones will be muted. However, you can use the Q&A to post questions to the panelists. The webinar is recorded and will be posted on the, VCP, uh, the DICP website. Uh, and uh, we do have a very short poll that's going to be available uh, towards the end uh, that we would like for you to complete. Uh, so please stick around for that. Uh, briefly introducing myself, my name is Alden Landry. I'm an assistant professor in emergency medicine, the assistant dean for the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership. And I'm going to be moderating this session today. Next slide. Uh, the important individuals that you're going to be hearing from over the course of the next hour are um, Dr. Sasha um, Bwetler. Uh, she is an anest the anesthesia residency program at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Danielle, uh, excuse me, Daniel uh, Sadawa Konefka. Uh, he's the anesthesia residency program director at MGH. And Dr. Sarah Nevis, uh, who's the anesthesia residency program director at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And so what we're gonna do now is have each of the program directors just give a very brief overview of their residency program. Um, and then we're gonna jump into a handful of questions that we have prepared. Uh, feel free to uh, jot down some notes and be prepared for questions for our program directors as we go through this discussion. And we'll start with our Brigham and Women's Residency Program. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so our program is one of the biggest programs in the country and one of the top programs. We have 28 residents in each class, including two combined Pete's anesthesia residents, uh, with, who we share with Children's Hospital. And we have 18 interns who are matched into our categorical track to pursue their medicine year here at the Brigham in the medicine department. What is unique is our culture. Uh, it's a very highly academic environment that is warm and supportive. And therefore we are able to attract residents who are highly talented and accomplished in medicine, but who also have developed a passion to pursue their unique interests. And may it be in global health or healthcare policy, in innovation and other areas. And it's that passion uh, that carries them forward. And we, as the program, um, are dedicated to support on an individual level. We pull a lot of care and resources into our C1 tutorial uh, that just started this year again, 1st of July. All incoming residents start at the same time. Uh, the and the first week you spend 
only together with your new classmates, not in the OR, just going over the same educational curriculum, which is then followed the following weeks by daily lectures, teaching sessions uh, to which you come together with your peers each day in the afternoon. This is a very intense but very important time for our program to allow the residents to connect to each other and to form the bonds that I have always served us very well. The residents get to know each other in and outside the hospital very well. Um, the other unique part that I see about our program is uh, the Wednesday morning didactics that we have. Uh, you can see it also on the slide there that are up. We have dedicated time Wednesday morning, each Wednesday mornings dedicated to education. So either the C1 class um, has their lecture morning and then the next week the C2, C3 class. During the first year, um, the, the didactics are geared towards the basic exam at the end of the first year. And then as a second and third year, the didactic lectures are geared towards the advanced exam. Again, this morning is protective and uh, for your education and the faculty covers the OR. So that would be kind of my overview over the program um, for my side. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, next, I believe is BIDMC's residency program. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Nevis. Um, I'm the program director for BIDMC. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about me first. Um, I uh, didn't train at BI. I came after a residency at Yale and um, an ICU fellowship at uh, over across the street at Brigham. Uh, and uh, I split my time between the ICU and the OR as a critical care trained anesthesiologist. Um, and my research interests are in um, feedback, curriculum development, um, and substance abuse prevention um, among anesthesiologists. Um, a little bit about our program. Uh, we are a medium-sized program. We have 18 residents per class. We have both advanced and uh, categorical tracks. So we have 12 interns per year, um, and then an additional six that join us in their CA one year. Um, what uh, makes our program uh, awesome and unique, uh, quotes that I'm supposed to answer, I think what really makes us unique is, um, you know, uh, we have world-class training in a really supportive environment. Uh, we attract innovative and broad-minded faculty and residents, um, and we're really... Um, Beth Israel as, a, uh, as an institution is very collaborative. And so we um, have a lot of uh, crosstalk with other specialties um, and uh, our residents uh, train with, um, you know, ha have a lot of interaction with um, faculty from other subspecialties as part of their training and um, in, including um, in addition to all of the, uh, the usual anesthesia um, education as well. I think, um, You'll notice uh, among the three of us, um, Brigham, Mass General, and, um, and ourselves, there's uh, always been a lot of crosstalk between us. So our, our particular programs will um, probably look uh, a bit similar, but I think um, something that we all, um, all value is really offering um, a really strong academic environment, but in a way that um, supports uh, the trainee and um, really cultivates their strengths um, and their interests. So people who come to our program, um, love anesthesia, but they um, they also have uh, particular drives, whether it's in, you know, within anesthesia, within OR leadership, research interests, um, global health, um, community outreach, and we um, have a very uh, broad sense of where, you know, what the anesthesiologist purview is, right, and uh, we love um, uh, residents who come to our program with uh, a lot of ideas, a lot of passions, and um, helping, uh, helping them support, uh, helping support them as they grow. Um, as you can see here, we have a, a Twitter account at BIDMC. Um, we have an Instagram, which is run by um, one of our APDs. These are all uh, pictures from there. Uh, I don't know if you, if you can uh, zoom in, you can see, but we have um, a really close-knit group. Um, and so I encourage you to learn more about us there and please join us um, at uh, our virtual open houses, which our dates are uh, TBD, but very soon. Uh, we're just waiting on a couple of uh, logistics. So um, looking forward to answering all of your questions. Awesome. And last but certainly not least, MGH residency program. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan. I'm the uh, program director here at MGH. Um, a little bit about our program. And, uh, you know, as we were putting this together, it was hard to sort of pick and choose what to put on here. So um, we put a little QR code so you could see a, a little bit more about us and that'll take you to our, our applicant site and so forth. But um, broadly speaking, uh, we're a four year residency program. We have 26 positions per year. Um, uh, at least that's what we match. We typically will have a couple of what are called immediate starts or our positions. So they'll start as PGY2, but uh, 26 categorical residents and then continued on through. Our intern year is a transitional year. Uh, you involve yourself uh, in both medicine and surgery rotations. And uh, we also have you do some uh, anesthesia stuff as well. You do a little bit of acute pain, some ICU with us. Uh, and embedded in the intern career, uh, curriculum is a uh, every two weeks, uh, we have a uh, dedicated anesthesia education day where we do sort of anesthesia fundamentals. It's a bunch of longitudinal courses and things like lethal events, um, simulation, how to read evidence, that sort of thing. Uh, the anesthesia part of it kicks off in staggered form. So we actually will take people from intern year starting in April, then May, June, July, uh, and it's about seven of you at a time. Uh, the reason we do that is everybody gets their dedicated month one-on-one -on -one with attendings. You get first pick of cases so we can really customize things. Now that does mean you'll go back to finish some intern year electives or so forth if you come early and not if you come late and so forth. Um, but it's a really customized onboarding in our tutorial. Uh, <clears throat> and then we try to be pretty thoughtful about progression of your, your uh, curriculum, your uh, different rotations as you go through residency. Uh, there's a fair amount of flexibility depending on what it is that you'd like to go into. Uh, and then uh, towards the end, we try to do a lot of attending onboarding with things like our first call role and, and so forth. Um, I think if I had to tell you what the core of our ethos is, it's about improvement. It's about getting better. Um, we're a very learning oriented place, which what does learning oriented mean? Well, you're going to encounter all sorts of challenges and hard things and what you do when you encounter those things sort of speaks to whatever your your overarching goal is and your goal could be that you just want to look good and and so you'll try to avoid things that'll make you look sillier um, but that's not that's not what learning oriented is that's that's trying to look good uh, what we're about is learning um, and mastery so that we can take better better care of the next patient so when we uh, have the opportunity to run at challenges or um, uh, work through things that might be tough or maybe even do something that, that we might feel like, oh, maybe we're not up to this, but we know we can do it in a supported way and we'll keep our patients safe. We, we run at those things um, because the goal is never to get to a point in our careers where here's where we are and this is good enough. It's no, no, what's, what's, the, next, what's the next level up? How do, we, how do we reach for mastery and expertise, not just competence? That's a little bit about us and look forward to uh, looking through your applications and uh, meeting some of you in person at some point. Awesome. Well, I want to say thank you to all three of you for your introductions of your residency programs. It's a really helpful overview. Um, but let's get into a little bit of the nitty gritty as we think about this application season. And so I want to start with you, uh, Sasha, with the first question. You know, this is going to be a different application season than years uh, prior. Um, and given all the complexities that are happening, um, I think it's really important to just start with the baseline. So can you give us an overview of the timeline for this year's ERAS application uh, season? And then um, maybe weave in there also how you're preparing for this application season. Sure. So uh, ERAS opens for the applicants on September 1st. Um, however, we as a program can only start reviewing the applications end of September, which is the 29th of September this year. Um, we at the Brigham and um, maybe similar in the other programs, we receive over 1500 and at the Brigham, we do not use any filters, any cutoffs, any pre-screens. So we actually review each application that comes in. So in order to do that fairly and well, uh, it takes us time. So I ask for patience. Um, we would hope to be, to have gotten back uh, to all applicants to let them know about interviews opportunities the latest by mid-November but usually it takes us a few weeks because our approach is holistic so we review all parts of an application again because we don't have any cutoffs then um, 
this interview season, we received guidelines uh, from our GME office uh, at our institution, and that I know will apply to MGH as well, is that it will be again a virtual interview season. The guidelines is very clear, so our, we will have virtual interview days. In addition, therefore, we have planned, and, and similar to last year, we will have several virtual open houses, and I just heard Dr. Nivis saying that will be the same at BI. So we actually have the first one already coming up this Saturday. They are uh, planned for different aspects, basically, of our program. So the first one happens to be an open house for UIIM. We will have one for women in medicine. We will have one for LGBTQIA plus open house, just to name a few. They will be all posted on our website. And uh, we encourage anyone uh, to attend, but they're completely voluntary. So you don't have to feel pressurized. Um, last but not least, we're working out the details on the guidance we have received for second looks, uh, which is that uh, the GME office does allow them, but not um, in the format of an interview. Uh, so which for us will mean that it will the opportunity to meet residents most likely but of course but not as program directors because again we have to re restrain ourselves from uh, an interaction that may be um, looked at as an part of an interview so second looks might will be available and we're working out the details also especially to facilitate that for those who you know if we who is difficult doing doing travel and we will not expect that at all so we are not we will only do it if it's a strong wish on the part of the applicant. We are not expecting that. We went through a season last year with only virtual interviews, and we think it went very well. And, and that's kind of my answer. So, so it, it will go well this year. We can assure all of you it went well for all of the last programs and I think of, for the applicants. So rest reassured that even though it's virtual again, it will go well. Well, thank you for that. And I think it's really important for um, students to uh, appreciate that last comment that you made in that we survived virtual interviews last year. We survived um, this process uh, at a distance and um, um, we are pleased with the uh, trainees that we brought on board and hopefully our trainees are uh, pleased with their um, match results. And so uh, as we go through this application season, um, despite all the changes with the um, September 1 open date, the September 29th, where everything becomes available uh, to programs, both your MSPE or Dean's letter and your application, um, you know, we will um, go through this process in a stepwise fashion to make sure that every applicant uh, has their application fairly reviewed um, before we offer an inter offer interview. So, so thank you for, for giving that background. Uh, Sarah, I want to go to you and just can you, you know, maybe give some additional advice, maybe from the student perspective uh, as to how students should be preparing for this upcoming application season? Is there anything different that the students should be thinking about aside from the virtual component of it all? Um, I think it always helps to get um, as much information as you can uh, about programs, not just through more formal channels like looking at websites and um, uh, and going to the open houses, but you know, talking to residents uh, at your medical schools, attendings at your medical schools, find out where they went, find out um, if they like their program, what advice they have, all that that sort of information about what to look for and what to consider uh, can be really helpful. Um, I think uh, an important um, piece to remember in going through this process is to really, um, it's a, a time to really think about uh, who you are and what you're looking at your life to be, what kind of uh, physician, what kind of person, what kind of anesthesiologist uh, you want to be. And um, look for that um, in a program. I, I, uh, I responded really well to what um, Dan said about, you know, it's not about looking good, really, you know, um, as you get into this right now, it's it, pedigree matters less. It's all the uh, um, trimmings matter a lot less. And it's really where am I going to thrive the most? Where am I going to feel um, safe and comfortable enough to be uncomfortable or try something that I haven't tried or not be the best at something. Um, and so that takes, um, that takes a lot of reflection and, um, a lot of stuff that maybe not can't, um, 
be observed really well um, on paper or on a website, um, but is more the vibe you're getting, the what you hear from um, people that you know from certain programs or in certain specialties. So I think that's um, a period of self-reflection uh, can be uh, really helpful in this time leading up to it. Thank you for that. Uh, so Dan, uh, I want to talk very briefly about um, OA rotations. Um, we are finally hosting students for the first time in about uh, 16 months for visiting clerkships. Um, we're excited to have them here. Um, but unfortunately for some students, it's a relatively narrow window for them to participate in, in, in these rotations. Um, and so how will OA rotations be viewed from your perspective as a program director uh, this application season? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think I can offer some good news. Uh, don't don't worry. <laughs> you know, even even before COVID, away uh, rotations were not a make or break type of thing. It's a way for you get to get to know the program for sure. It's a way for them to get to know you for sure. But you know, bear in mind the overwhelming majority of residents that match at any one of our programs didn't do an away rotation there. Um, so uh, you know, especially with all of the new things with uh, with COVID. Um, you know, in terms of restrictions and narrow windows, uh, it, we, we, we get it. They weren't uh, make or break before. They're certainly not make or break now. So big picture, my recommendation is don't, don't worry about it. Programs understand what's going on and everybody's in the same boat. Perfect. And for you, Sasha, um, you know, there are some students who really wanted to get away rotations, but they weren't able to do so. Um, you know, uh, how will students who are uh, able to get away rotations going to be compared to those who aren't? And if so, um, students who weren't able to do away rotations, um, you know, will they be compared differently or looked at differently from an application standpoint from your, from your program's perspective? Yeah, as Dan said, same for us, and I think for all programs uh, in the area is that very clearly, even before COVID, the majority of residents never had a rotation with us. So keep that in mind. So even before COVID, it was rare that someone was able to do that for two reasons. One is all of those rotations had to be applied and are run entirely by the HMS register. So at times people would apply for it, but not get it simply because of limited space. And second, it's a financial burden. And I think that is very important. I think we're very aware of that aspect, uh, at least by now, that this is not an option for everyone. And so we will never, um, would never put pressure on anyone to, to, to pursue a rotation that puts them in, in financial difficulties. Um, and um, also simply, it's often not possible for someone. So we will never hold it against someone. And I think that applies to all the programs in the area. So do not worry about it. That's the message. It's not a problem. And, you know, we really enjoy um, students who come and rotate with us. I think it's um, a great to see students getting to know our hospitals and seeing uh, the city of Boston um, and having a different perspective. Um, we also recognize, as you mentioned, Sasha, the cost limitations, the other barriers that come into place. And as much as we try and support students through the visiting clerkship program, we know that first from a timeline perspective, it doesn't always work for every student. Um, and so I think it's, you know, really just important to say that if you're able to do a rotation, that's great. Uh, we'd love to have you. We'd love to see you on campus. We'd love to get to know you a little bit more. But if you aren't able to, we still want to get to know you and see your application and uh, hopefully get to interview you uh, when it comes uh, come time for that. So um, don't be discouraged if you weren't able to get a rotation, but do be encouraged because we do want, still want to get to know you and see you. And so um, I think part of the reason why students like to do away rotations is because they get to learn programs and they get to see them from the inside out. And so Sarah, um, if you know, a student has a particular interest in learning more about a program, um, how should they go about letting the program know that they're interested in them or getting to know them a little bit better? Yeah, um, I think uh, first uh, and foremost, you know, uh, learning as much as you can about the program uh, can help solidify um, uh, what it is exactly that you um, might like, as opposed to you've always wanted to go to some place and you may not necessarily know uh, a lot of the specifics about it. And so I think what comes across to us um, pretty clearly, whether it's um, in the application and the supplemental material or on the interview, is someone who um, has a genuine interest um, in the specifics of our program. Um, so I would encourage um, I would encourage research upfront. Um, I, again, I'm a, a 
big fan of sort of the, the relationships. So ask around, find out who you know um, went to that program, um, reach out to people that are uh, our alumni, um, or if you happen to note, um, you know, someone who's from your program, right, ask them about it. Um, if you have a close relationship with someone who is from the program that you're interested in, you know, ask them to shoot an email, right? We definitely get uh, emails or, you know, I've gotten texts from alumni at various places being like, hey, I'm sending you a, a med student's application. They, you know, I loved working with them, things like that, right? That aren't necessarily as formal as a, um, uh, uh, as a letter of recommendation, but it's just um, all those things matter to us, right? Relation the world gets smaller as you advance uh, in um, in the medical field, and so everyone knows someone else, and so that that can be very um, that can be very helpful. Um, but but aside from all that, right? It's um, uh, more practically, I guess. Um, I if I'm interested uh, if I'm interested in a program, I'm going to look to see if they have any specific supplemental material that they are um, requesting. Um, last year, we asked um, that applicants include uh, any particular reason why they were interested in BI in a in a paragraph in their um, personal statement. And um, some people did, some people didn't. Some people had something that was more generic. Some people really had something that was very compelling, and all that that stood out. And so I think, you know, if you are um, consistent in your interest in the program, right? You're someone um, who uh, has made your interest known, um, reaches out. Um, and who um, uh, has a genuine interest that comes through in the um, supplemental material that can be um, that can be very helpful. Awesome, thank you for that. And I guess the, to follow up with that question, Dan, um, you know, any suggestions on you know or, or your thoughts on uh, if an uh, applicant is uh, going to reach out to a resident or to a faculty member? Is that something that's appreciated? Do you think they're good sources of information for for uh, getting to know a, pr a program a little bit better? Oh, really good question again. Um, so uh, I think you want to be thoughtful about it. Um, one thing I think is probably fair. I don't think you should feel compelled to reach out because you think everyone is doing it and therefore you have to do it to get an interview or to be looked at. That I don't think that's certainly not necessary and can actually kind of backfire if it's sort of a, well, why are we talking? And, you know, instead I'd be thoughtful about it. And when you're thoughtful about it, there's definitely value in it. Um, sort of as Sarah was saying, you want to research the programs beforehand, learn what you can. I think especially in the peri-COVID time, lots of programs have put a lot of information, a lot of work into their websites. You can actually learn quite a bit online. And then talking to people who you know who are recent graduates uh, uh, is, is helpful. Now, after you've done that, um, I think you're probably in a pretty good position up until interviews. And then I, I would, if you interview at a place and you think this is a place I really want to learn more about to see if I, if I fit with the culture, if their values match my values, I think that's probably the time to more aggressively pursue resident conversations, faculty conversations, to make sure that it feels like a good match to you. Uh, one other thing that's useful, I think, for follows up with follow-ups with uh, residents and faculty is understanding particular program aspects. So, if you're really interested in uh, a research track or um, doing uh, education work with someone or global health work, or and you want to know, hey, what does that actually look like? I see what it says on the website, but I want to understand from the perspective of someone who's walked the path that I'm interested in. Those are the connections that I think are very valuable. Um, so I, I'd say, in summary, don't stress about doing that with every program. It's not that particularly helpful um, uh, in terms of marketing yourself, but can be quite useful, I think, when you're coming down to trying to make your decisions and where do you put each program on rank lists. Um, I just, sorry, Alan, I just wanted to add, if you are lucky enough to um, get some sit down time or face time with someone in program leadership, whether, you know, you're on a visiting clerkship and you get to have a sit down, um, don't squander the, those few minutes, make the most of that time by coming um, prepared with you some talking points about yourself. Um, about what you're looking for in that program. Um, you know, I've had a couple of meetings where, you know, they were excited to meet and then, you know, we didn't, we were just kind of stalled. Like we weren't sure what to do. You know, I wasn't sure what they wanted from me. They weren't sure what they were supposed to ask. So um, definitely make the most of that, um, that valuable opportunity. Yeah, Thank you for that. Go ahead, Sarah. Briefly want to add that I think also for those who may not have a connection, I think, you know, even myself coming in, 
two decades ago to the US, I had no connection. So I want to reassure those who don't have those connections, you know, we will review again every application. So it is important that you present all your achievements. And I know you have so much achieved already to be at this point, put it in your application, present your strengths. Um, we will review it. So I feel I just want to reassure those who don't have those connections. Um, you can still succeed. You do not always need a connection to be successful. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I guess my, my closing um, statement on all of this, uh, wonderful advice from, from the program directors, um, but something that I've heard students do um, uh, to or go to for a source of information um, is websites and blogs. And, um, and I would just be cautious on getting information from those sites um, because they're not always accurate, up to date. And a lot of that information can be misinformation uh, especially if there's someone who um, is a little bit frustrated with the program and they may misrepresent an interaction that they had. Uh, so if you are looking for information, I think the, the programs uh, do a great job of providing you with opportunities um, for meeting residents, um, you know, and so I encourage you to take advantage of those um, opportunities that are through the programs because uh, they're doing that with uh, truly giving you the best opportunity to get more information about our program. Uh, as opposed to some of those forums and websites that may be out there. Uh, so I want to pivot, and I think, Sasha, you were you were hinting at this, and so I think it's a good segue for, for this next question. You know, we've had uh, a, an incredibly messy year and a half. Um, students may have um, stumbled a little bit on step one, or they may have had uh, a core clerkship rotation that didn't go as well as they would like it to, and they had a lower evaluation. Um, but they're still putting their applications together to move forward. And so how do you encourage students to put their application together to best represent themselves uh, so that they can uh, impress you the best for, for this application season? Yeah, well, I look at it like this. Each of us, you know, we all have weaknesses and strengths, no matter how successful we are. So I think it is important that we reflect and understand our weaknesses and then find strategies how to address them. So this will actually make us successful. And therefore, I always suggest um, to students who, who, who have you know, asked me this question before to be transparent about anything that they consider a problem spot and how they will address it. Because that's really, as I said, what makes us successful, that we look at our weaknesses and develop strategies. No, that's why you often have a mentor who helps you with that. Um, and then, as I mentioned beforehand, the process is holistic. We look at everything. So in our program, it would be extremely rare that just one thing determines the face of your whole application. So in summary, look at where your weaknesses are, be transparent, keep in mind your whole application should count. You want to come to a program that takes you as a whole person, all your accomplishments into account and not just one little piece. Um, and you will choose the right program. <laughs> I like that. It, you, and that's a really great advice. Choose a program that's going to want you as your whole, which is your strengths and your weaknesses, not just your strengths. So thank you for that. Um, so uh, next question, I guess, is going to go uh, to uh, Sarah. Um, and this is a question that came up in the uh, from the students as well, uh, is about step two. Um, and we're still trying to find opportunities to take step two. A lot of the parametric sites have been closed. Uh, students may not have been able to get into take step two. Is that something that you're going to be looking for as a part of the uh, application package when you're able to look at applications on the 29th? And if so, what should students be thinking about from that standpoint? Yeah, similar to um, uh, Brigham and, and I believe MGH as well, we take a holistic approach to our review of applications. So we don't have any uh, hard cutoffs in the sense of either scores or presence or absence uh, of a score. Um, that being said, you know, so I wouldn't worry if you have not uh, taken step two prior to applying. Um, uh, I think, you know, uh, as a whole, as a specialty, um, uh, residency programs are trying to shift away from using test scores um, as much as possible and trying to emphasize that less. Um, the, the challenge, the, the flip coin to that though, is um, a lot of the data points that we have in, in differentiating applica applicants um, are, are, are blurring, right? And so it becomes 
um, while someone isn't their test score, um, it's also hard to, you know, there are a lot of good programs, and there are a lot of good applicants. And so how do we um, see you, how do, how do your individual traits and strengths and characteristics come out in an application um, that, uh, you know, where Dean's letter doesn't rank, uh, rank applicants, we don't have test scores, um, letters of recommendations sometimes are not as um, in depth and specific as we would like. So um, if uh, I would say uh, we are uh, de-emphasizing test scores, and so I wouldn't feel that you necessarily that you have to go out and and force yourself into a situation you're not you don't feel ready for or comfortable with, or that will uh, you don't think will um, add to your application. Um, I think uh, Sasha's uh, advice was great. You want to look at um, carefully, and sometimes you can ask someone to review your application sort of for you, right? Someone uh, at your school. Um, to see what, how am I coming across, or what it, what does this look like to you? Where can what can I highlight more? What can um, uh, how can I address weaknesses in this application to um, really present the the best version of yourself, to present yourself as a as a package, right, and not get lost sort of in the shuffle? It is still fifteen hundred applications to go through, and even when we read through them um, individually, it can be hard to to separate things out. So. Um, you know, I, 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 it's hard, right? You would love to, to have an idea that everyone comes through perfectly, but it can be really tough. So um, I, I wouldn't feel pressured to do something you don't feel comfortable with because you think it's absolutely um, required, but have a, a careful eye towards what you're um, presenting. Great. And so Dan, uh, another key component of the application is the personal statement. Uh, and I know a lot of students are you know, working on that third or fourth draft and trying to make sure that the personal statement uh, speaks uh, uh, about them. One of the things that's um, uh, I, that I expect to see, and I know uh, we were dealing with last year, is when you're going through 1,500 applications, a lot of them start to sound the same. The personal statements start to repeat themselves. And oftentimes, uh, you know, students talk about uh, similar topics, and one topic that they're probably going to talk about a lot is COVID. Um, so I guess part one of this question, should students even be mentioning uh, COVID in their personal statement? And then two, what are you looking for in a good personal statement as you're reviewing them? Uh, thanks, Alden. Um, I think what, what you said is right on. A lot, of, a lot of the personal statements can kind of blur together. Um, I think I'd, I'd even saw, uh, heard from one program director that, uh, that they were working on um, personal statement bingo with, uh, I like physiology, I like pharmacology, I like, you know, so, um, but, uh, you know, do you mention COVID? Um, I think you can. Um, I don't, I, I think COVID is, is so ever present uh, that if it, if it really has impacted the way that you think about things, your motivations, your passions, what it is you want to do in medicine, then it makes sense. I think to mention COVID because it's around but hasn't impacted you in a way that drives your motivations is probably unnecessary. Um, I actually have a have a, a recipe that I give to applicants who ask me for personal statements. So I'll, I'll share that now, um, <clears throat> and it's with the with the caveat, the little asterisk of make sure that you review each of the programs websites that you're looking at because a lot of programs will have specific requests for things that they want to see in the uh, in the personal statement. I think Sarah was mentioning, for example, that they want. A specific paragraph about what you're looking at for BI. We we do the same thing. I wouldn't be surprised um, if uh, um, uh, Sasha's program is is doing similar. But here's 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 my here's my general recipe though. Um, and and you don't have to do this, but here's what here's what I like to see. So first, I, I want to know about you. I want to know about your background. What makes you tick? What drives you? what motivates you, what past experiences you have that tell that story and, and some things that you've done that you're particularly proud of. I don't mind if it's a little bit of a repeat of your CV, so long as it really speaks to your motivations and your passions. I wanna know who you are that's come to this point. Right? Tell me about, about you. The second part is tell me where you think you're going. You know, uh, five, 10 years after residency, What's, what's going to be where you're going to end up where it's not just a job, it's a career, it's a calling. Like this would be amazing. And it doesn't have to have specifics, right? You don't have to know what fellowship you're going to want to do or, but like maybe you know that you really value um, certain types of relationships, you really value mentorship, you really value education, you really value global, whatever it is, like where, where are you heading? And then 
here's the neat thing that that sets you up for. You've got um, everything about you up to this point. You've got the you in the future, five to 10 years from now. And there's this gap. It's going to take a lot of work on your part to fill that gap. But now you need to have a program that's going to have the resources that you need to help you walk that path. So the third part of the personal statement is specific to the program that you're looking at. Um, and it's, here's the gap that I have between where I am and where I want to go. And here's how your program helps me fill that gap. And, and much more than just Oh, strong curriculum and didactics and, you know, the things that you could generically say to every program, because that's very easy to spot, but actually do your homework, learn about the programs that you're interested in. It's something you're going to have to do anyway, when you make your rank list. Um, and that sort of, um, that sort of personal statement, when you read one like that, um, I think it reflects someone who's really thoughtful, mature, reflective, genuinely interested in the program. That's the type of statement that draws my attention uh, as you're reading through the 1500 plus uh, applications. Which is a crazy amount of personal statements uh, yeah. uh, just to think about. No, I, and I think you, you, you really drove home a point to make it personal and to make it a statement. So thank you for, for sharing that formula. Could I, could I just add one more thing? Um, sure. I, I really like that template. I think the other piece, if you have a weakness on your application, um, uh, the personal statement is very helpful. That's where I'm going to look if I have a question mark or if I'm wondering about something. Um, you know, you always have the interview to um, to explain that, but you have to get to the interview first, right? So if there's something that I'm going to be wondering about, you want to um, try and uh, kind of artfully address that. Great point. Thank you for uh, for bringing that up. Um, and I want to go to you, Sasha. Uh, one of the other key components of uh, the application is the letters of recommendation. Um, we're going to be expecting to see really strong letters. Um, who do you encourage students to um, solicit those letters from? And um, you know what, should, what goes into a strong letter and how can students help their letter writers um, write the best letter of recommendation for them? Yeah, I think the, the first, uh, probably most important part is that the letter writer has actually known their applicant well, um, because this will, first of all, will facilitate you know the the information and the knowledge that the letter writer can put into the letter and it sh it shines through it becomes often very evident whether the letter writer has actually uh, gotten to know the applicant well over either a shorter but intense time or over extended time so look for someone that actually really knows you the second part is, yes, it can matter that it is an experienced letter writer, someone who has, you know, has over a few years, uh, you know, experience of letter writing, because there are some keywords uh, kind of that are, that are in there that we who read 1500 applications are now familiar with. And a, a letter writer who has done this work in the past is probably better at doing it. Um, for us, it's entirely okay to have only one letter from an anesthesiologist because we look at you as a clinician, um, as a physician um, who's entering our field. So we as much put value on uh, letter writers from other co cool rotations or uh, long-term ambulatory um, uh, office days. Um, so it doesn't have to be um, several uh, letters from several anesthesiologists, uh, because sometimes I notice that and I, I, I think maybe someone got the advice that it has to be primary from a specialty that you're entering. So not for our program. And maybe last not least, sometimes we get research letters. They, they are for the most part for us only important for a research focused applicant like an MD PhD or an equivalent um, especially those who are obviously applying to our research track otherwise may not be as important so for the vast majority of residents probably not as important um, it is yeah so that would be my general thoughts on it and so one thing that I always do to encourage students, especially when I get asked to write a letter of recommendation, um, is, you know, have um, either a draft of your personal statement ready or a copy of your ERAS application or your resume and be able to give that to the person writing the letter to make it a little bit easier for us uh, to make sure that we're speaking um, uh, in your own, on your best behalf. Um, and if possible, meet up with the person either through Zoom or in person just to 
uh, make sure that they uh, feel comfortable writing you a strong letter of recommendation. Um, part of the time students will get letters of recommendation from away rotations. That's may probably not going to be the case this, year, uh, this time around, but it's really helpful to know that for anesthesia, um, you can have uh, letter writers who um, aren't necessarily anesthesiologists and uh, still be in the best position to, uh, to match. So thank you for sharing. Um, Sarah, just quickly with the interviews, uh, it sounds like uh, the Brigham MGH uh, has uh, decided on virtual interviews. I know uh, other specialties have decided on virtual interviews. Um, have Has your program decided or has BIDMC decided the direction that they're going to go with virtual interviews or not? Yes, of course, uh, we will also be doing virtual interviews. I think um, like the other programs where we're looking on, um, looking for uh, uh, options for an equitable way to uh, allow uh, residents to visit the program if they're interested, but it would, um, as Sasha said, be uh, decoupled from you know meetings with leadership or anything like that, something that would be purely um, for the applicant's benefit to, to see the place. But I think we had, um, we were really uh, pleasantly surprised, frankly, uh, with how the uh, virtual season went um, last year. I think, um, you know, applicants are able to put their best foot forward when they're on their home turf. And uh, Virg, I felt like I saw a lot less um, nerves and jitters uh, in the interviews and people were able to um, really present their best self. So um, we're happy to continue that. Great. And so with that, Dan, how do you uh, encourage people to prepare for virtual interviews and how can they make themselves um, look the best um, when doing these virtual interviews? I don't know that it's too, too different uh, from, from what you do for a regular in-person interview. And, and that is know the program, you know, read all about it and come with the questions that are thoughtful and that reflect the things that really matter to you. Uh, so that when you have that extra time at the end of the interview, it's, it's not filled with awkward science, it's silence. It's filled with uh, you, you really taking advantage of what it is that you need to learn about. Um, during the interviews, stay focused, stay engaged, show enthusiasm. Um, if, uh, uh, if, if you have a very, very sort of um, uh, uh, not very excited uh, manner, like talk to people and say like, hey, how do I spice this up and make sure you, you smile occasionally and so forth, because it's hard to get to know people virtually and those things, uh, though, though probably not consciously, can, can sort of slip into the, oh, maybe we didn't connect as much or, or something like that, or maybe they didn't really care for our program very much. Um, other things, don't yawn, uh, don't uh, check your computer screen for something else, don't text on your phone. Those, those, those things, though they can be done covertly, often kind of show through and, it, and it, um, people make assumptions about your interests and your dedication to the interview or even worse about professionalism. So try to stay on point for the interviews as best you can. Um, the, the one uh, other thing that I'll mention too, people come from all sorts of different backgrounds and have all sorts of different um, technologies and resources at their disposal. And we understand that. So don't worry about technical issues at all. You know, if your connection's in and out, if it, we, we get it, that does not reflect on you. You don't have to worry about that. I, uh, so many of those things came up uh, on, on both ends, you know, last year programs and for applicants. And, and it's a very, we're very, very forgiving. I, I think I remember I was talking to one applicant and, uh, uh, in the middle of our, our thing, the fire alarm in her building went off um, and she just kind of looked at me and I said, is that, is that your fire alarm? And she said, yeah. And I was like, Do you, should, should you maybe leave? <laughs> and she said, well, I could go to the balcony. And she was on the third floor. And I was like, no, no, we can, we'll talk later. So those things come up. Okay, that's, that's life. And, and just uh, uh, forgive yourself those things. We definitely will. Uh, thank you for that, Ed, and uh, just sharing the fact that we're all humans dealing with technology and have different resources, and I think it's really important for us to have backup plans from a residency perspective as far as how to handle those uh, small uh, issues that may pop up, um, but from an applicant perspective, it seems like a catastrophe, um, but in reality, um, we recognize uh, the limitations of technology and that we're doing this virtual and we still want to get to know you and we'll do whatever we can, uh, even if it's, uh, as Dan was indicating, a telephone call to finish the, uh, the, the conversation uh, or even rescheduling job to, to make sure the interview goes off uh, without a hitch. So um, we recognize technology will be a barrier for some, but not for all. All right, uh, Sasha, just to, to wrap up the discussion about the application process on the very back end of all of this um, in February, uh, students have completed all of their interviews and now they're putting together their 
their match list, uh, their rank list? And how do you encourage students to um, go through after they've done the interviews and met the programs and maybe participated in some of those virtual events, uh, those second looks? How do, what, what do you encourage students to do when they're trying to put their rank list together? Well, so the first aspect is to be reassured that the matching system itself is set up in the way that it truly prioritizes the preferences of the applicants. So the applicant should rank the program, may it be advanced, track versus categorical, exactly in the order of the preference. I think that's the number one message. Re list as you want, based on your preference. Number two is the harder advice to give. Now we have mentioned today all the different aspects to consider in a program. What is the location? What opportunities in the area of your interest are there? Um, maybe what's the complexity and depth of cases? But from my experience, really what I think matters most is what you think is the best fit for you. And I think um, Dr. Landry mentioned it, you, you can try to listen to many online chats, but at the end of the day, it's you who will have to then pursue the career at a certain program in a certain city. So to find that match, that fit, uh, I think the, the key is to talk to as many residents as possible, then take that time of reflection, Dr. Navis mentioned, to sit back and really get a sense of what will work for you as an individual. And that's the hardest part, but I think if you take your time for that, you will make the right decision and then rank as you think about it, as you feel. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, just uh, moving quickly, um, and I want to make sure we try and pay attention to these questions um, because I think they're really important and um, it goes into what you were talking about is finding the part is finding the program that fits you. Um, Sarah, and we're doing a lot of discussions now about wellness, um, making sure that our trainees feel supported. Um, can you talk a little bit about what your program is doing to support trainees uh, and to make sure that they are well as an entire individual and not just um, doing well in the hospital, but maybe struggling personally? Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, we have really comprehensive wellness programming for all the staff uh, and trainees. And I think that's um, really underappreciated aspect. You know, the imagery I always like is, you know, the one stick is like easy to break, but the whole bunch of sticks together, right, is hard to break. And so I think um, we really try to foster that community um, within um, not just uh, our program, but the department at large and um, the hospital larger than that. So we have um, uh, not just um, social events, like like happy hours and things and yoga and that type of thing. Uh, but we also uh, encourage, we have a large portion of our department who uh, have received formal peer support training. Um, within the residency program, we have uh, wellness chairs every year who are, um, again, uh, you know, specifically have a sp particular passion for not just the social events aspect of wellness, but also, you know, designing Last year, our residents, uh, the wellness chairs created these confession sessions where um, they basically had these just support group talks for the new CA1s coming through periodically throughout the year to just kind of debrief, talk about dumb stuff they did as CA1s, you know, tricks of the trade, tips and pearls and things just to share vulnerabilities with each other, um, really kind of break down those barriers um, between, um, between us as individuals. Um, and then we also have a um, faculty advisor program where um, uh, we have a core group of faculty that are then assigned a few CA1s, CA2s, CA3s, and some interns in these sort of families, right? And it's uh, sort of um, a support group that you get kind of right out the gate, right? So you have someone to, um, to turn to and talk to. I mean, I think a lot of our relationships sort of develop organically because we are a tight-knit group, but we want to make sure we don't um, miss anyone and, and people feel like they are um, not alone. Thank you. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to support trainees um, as whole individuals and, uh, you know, we understand you're here for your training, um, but so much of your life exists beyond uh, what happens in the hospitals. And I think it's really important to understand that uh, mentorship and support can, can really go a long way, especially through the tougher times that may come along with, with, uh, with residency. Um, Dan, can you talk a little bit about the culture of Boston and specifically maybe dive into the uh, topic around how your UIM trainees have experienced living here in the city? Sure. It's a really important question. Um, so, you know, uh, Massachusetts tends to, tends to be more liberal, more accepting. I think, you know, that said, uh, we're 
we're still a place that has issues like the rest of the country. Um, so uh, our Center for Diversity and Inclusion uh, did a survey last year. Uh, they found that uh, I think it was around two thirds thought that Boston was the same or better than places that they'd been before in terms of uh, reported discrimination. That said, there were some who, who reported that it was worse than they'd been before. I think that was uh, up to maybe a third of, of, of folks. Um, <clears throat> and of the people that they surveyed, two thirds of the community said that at some point in Boston in general, at some point while they had been here, two thirds of them had reported um, that they had disrespectful treatment at some time because of their race, somewhere in Boston on the T or, or what have you. Um, you know, I think within the hospital walls, it's it's substantially better. Um, and uh, I, you know, for just as as an example of sort of dedication, and and I think, and I suspect that this is what you'd find across of across Harvard. Last year at MGH, twenty six percent of matched applicants uh, were UIM, um, which is um, up from a prior MGH high, I think of 17%. And I think it just reflects a groundswell of attention and action that's uh, that's really putting, being thoughtfully put into um, regarding injustice and discrimination in the country. But uh, to, to be honest with you, Alden, uh, Alden no, no matter how you cut it, uh, we still have a lot of work to do. And thank you for that honest answer. I think it's, um, you know, uh, Ex the experience of racism is very much an individual uh, experience, um, and the, historically Boston has um, uh, a deserved reputation of a place that was not welcoming to um, minorities, and I think uh, there's, uh, there's been a lot of change that's happened. Unfortunately, reputations die hard, um, and I would encourage you all to, again, um, to ask these questions to uh, the trainees and get their opinions because they can tell you what their experiences are much different than we can as faculty um, and they can give you their insights and especially if they're coming from you know a similar background as, uh, as you were or uh, original uh, medical school or, or, or state uh, that you may be from uh, so getting that information from the trainees themselves would be really helpful um, because I think Boston is is a very different city than the way it's portrayed uh, in the media uh, is probably how I'll close out that question. So Sasha, I want to turn to you quickly. Um, this is probably an easy answer, uh, but you know, there's three residency programs across uh, the Harvard Teaching Hospitals. Um, do you all get along? Uh, what's the relationship like between the different hospitals? Well, we like to compete, but it's a cordial, healthy competition. Um, that way, we actually are encouraged to improve ourselves, no? Uh, look at our weaknesses each year, and that's how all of us get better. Um, it's also very important that we remain open in academics uh, for that exchange, and um, that will advance us. So again, myself, um, I trained at the Brigham and um, completed my residency here at the Brigham and then went to MGH for a fellowship in critical care medicine. And I think that is actually this type of exchange is very enriching and necessary. And Dr. Nevis mentioned she was a fellow here at uh, the Brigham and now is the program director at BI. So I think this is really um, a core mission of academics to remain open, to have exchanges. Yes, compete, but it makes us all better. Great. Uh, yes, we, we're three different hospitals, um, three different residency programs, but um, I think there's opportunities for cross pollination collaboration, um, as you mentioned. All right, so we're, we're running out of time, and I know there's a couple other questions that unfortunately we'll be, won't be able to get to, um, but just uh, very quickly, I'll go um, Sarah, Dan, Sasha. Um, last closing piece of advice, something that we didn't talk about that you think uh, applicants really need to hear um, as they enter into this application season. So Sarah first. Yeah, um, I, uh, having been a med student, I feel qualified to say that uh, med students are the worst. Um, so just don't get too bogged down in the drama. It can be a really intense period of time and you're listening to a lot of different things. People are doing this and that and you can get lost pretty quickly. Um, so really just you know, stay true to yourself, do what feels right um, uh, for you and, and uh, don't get uh, bogged down in the drama. Dan? Uh, really, really well said. I think one of the blessings here is that you actually have a, a lot of time right now to get reflective and, and you don't always have that time to sit there, talk with mentors, talk with friends and figure out what really matters to you. 
don't worry about the stress. Don't worry about looking good. Uh, focus on doing good. I promise you, everything that's actually important will follow if you just focus on doing good. And Sasha. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, yes, I think, I think echoing what my colleagues did and adding what I mentioned earlier, realize how much you already have accomplished at this point. Um, and you can be joyful about that. There are not many and you're entering a new phase, no matter which program you're coming to, you will be a physician, you will have your first employment, there's a lot of joy ahead of you, despite all the challenges. So I think focus on where you want to live and with whom you want to start that career. So who are going to be your peers? Because think about it, all of us program directors will be long gone but your peers that you meet when you start your residency, those will be your lifelong friends in the field that you have chosen. So just reflect on that and then see the joy in the next years to come. Uh, you have accomplished a lot and you have a bright future ahead of you. Uh, really great pieces of advice and thank you for sharing that as part of uh, the closing. Um, I just wanna say thank you again for uh, joining us and participating. Thank you to all the students who um, have uh, listened in on our conversation. Um, I do want to just show that there are some other upcoming events that we have coming up. Um, we have uh, at the end of August, uh, the, forgive the typo, the uh, surgical subspecialties of uh, webinar series. We have our residency showcase, which a lot of our programs will be participating in on September 11th. We have some other upcoming events uh, as part of the DICP uh, efforts um, and the VCP efforts. So please be sure to check those out. I want to say thank you uh, to Jasmine, who's been in the background helping to keep us organized. Uh, thank you to Dr. Uh, Boitler, Dr. Nevis, uh, and Dr. Sadawi Konefka for joining us. Um, we look forward to seeing you during the interview trail, and uh, we look forward to hopefully getting you here for residency uh, and uh, helping to see you uh, learn and grow as, uh, as physicians. Uh, with that, uh, we will end this webinar. Please be sure to click on the very brief survey that you have available. Thank you.